I do remember that when I was about 11, 12, there suddenly became this very secret sort of whispering among girls about periods. Psst, so-and-so has their period. And it was like, oh my gosh, it was this massive deal. But I didn't know what it meant. It was just like waiting for doomsday. Like this is not supposed to be, which I guess is quite a unique experience maybe to trans uh, and gender diverse people who were assigned female at birth. When I first noticed that my body was showing signs that I was going to get my period, it was like, oh, I'm going to be in the club soon. I remember all the boys were handed out a stick of deodorant and the girls were handed out uh, pads. And sometimes the boys would trade their deodorant sticks to the girls uh, for their pads and would rip the pack open and stick it on our foreheads. Definitely felt a little bit of a shame around it and it didn't really feel like I could tell guys about it. Ikra, Aunt Flo, Shark Week, Period, Code Red. Menstruation has a lot of names, but despite being experienced by millions of people across the world, it's still rarely talked about. Aotearoa New Zealand is famous for its stunning landscapes and outdoor lifestyle. Nature is inherently inclusive, but some of our culture surrounding it is not. False beliefs, negative perceptions, and a lack of support and education mean that some people who menstruate don't get to enjoy Papa Tuanuku and all she has to offer. This series will explore why some people have struggled with their period in the outdoors and provide practical tools on how to change this for the future, bringing mana back to the experience of menstruation. Throughout most of history, the outdoors have primarily been considered the domain of men, prioritizing physical strength, toughness, and dominance over nature. Our colonial history has meant that stories of discovery and adventure have mostly focused on the experiences of white men. So it's not surprising that women, people of color, and those expressing gender or sex variations might struggle to feel accepted in the outdoors. The history of discourses around menstruation always revolve around shame and secrecy in Western contexts, but the positive thing is that we can change stories. Menstrual etiquette is a set of unspoken rules that we learn from other women, from watching other people, from commercials and television, all the ways we should behave when we're menstruating. And they all work together to make sure that no one knows. So in Western societies, there's this norm of concealment and it's all hush-hush and giggles, but that communicates this idea that there's something secret going on and potentially shameful. What's quite interesting is this idea of unwellness, that your body is somehow not okay. It lingers in the ideas that women have about their periods. There's so many accounts of young women thinking they're dying, they have a disease, that wrongness with your body thing just keeps coming through and the silence around it and the lack of education certainly doesn't help with those ideas. All of these kinds of myths and narratives around women's bodies are just sometimes ways of excluding them from spaces, including outdoor spaces. I talk about women often because that is where the burden lies mostly, but it isn't only women who menstruate. And now when we're aware of more genders and gender fluidity, I think the fact that we still talk about feminine hygiene products and women's issues is a huge barrier to just addressing this problem for all bodies that menstruate. Languages play an important role in communicating the values, stories and culture held by groups of people. Many words and their meanings don't translate easily or accurately between languages, which can sometimes lead to misrepresentation. When Aotearoa was colonised and Western ethnographers who were often male from a completely different culture, not speaking the language, came in and were observing the PA framework and the PA structure, gotten things really wrong and mixed up and documented women going to a different part of the PA and not working. So the assumption was that women were sent away and were separate from everyone because they were bleeding 
and because that therefore meant that they were like dirty and unclean, so you like put that separate. Actually, what was happening is these women recognised that they were in a state of tapu and they were sacred at that time. They had the choice to go and rest if they wanted to, and there was specific spaces that were created that you can go and bleed. There's other people from the whanau and the hapu that are looking after them and caring for them. So everyone had to learn about what periods was. Grandma was teaching it, dad was listening, brother and cousins were learning about it. It was celebrated by the whole pa, the whole whanau. Everyone knew and was happy for you that you were now transitioning into this next phase of your womanhood or your journey as a young person. All of the knowledge that I have shared comes from the work that Nahuia Murphy has done in terms of researching traditional Māori views and practices of menstruation. And so I have put my perspective on it as a Samoan woman who has grown up in Te Ao Māori but does not fuck a papa Māori in the work that I am now doing with girls and young women. With self-care, it starts with the mindset of it is okay to rest and have a day off. And I think in our society at the moment, it's a lot like, we can do anything while we're bleeding, which is so positive and cool. But also on the other end of the spectrum, acknowledging that you don't just have to power through and pretend you're not bleeding or you're not in pain and you're just gonna do things anyway. I feel that your ikura is like a vehicle for you to actually connect with self, connect with your body. What we're trying to dismantle is this really negative narrative that supports what the ethnographers have documented. If we look to the perspective of te ao Māori or traditional views on your ikura or your period, they called it things like waiwero, ikura, te awa, atua, the divine river of the gods. So that's a very different narrative. Again, it's that idea of what do you do with something that is precious? You take care of it. Not only am I gonna take care of the blood or how I'm disposing or managing my blood, I'm gonna take care of the vessel that it's coming from because it is sacred and tapu. Over the years, I have absolutely got more comfortable with having a period. Do I enjoy it? Nah, but I can deal with it more. Removing that gendered element of it would really help. Gender dysphoria comes from the idea that having a period is exclusively a woman's thing. If I didn't bleed every month, I might forget to maybe implement some self-care. So I always feel grateful for my body for reminding me to, to slow down and have a break.